a, rev, res, a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And it's not of St. John the Divine. John, John was the revelator. John was the one that the Holy Spirit used to pin down, and it, but it was not his revelation. The revelation is a, is a unveiling of the person of Jesus Christ. So all this book, as well as the rest of the Bible, but all the uh, book of Revelations is centered around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we go through this, as we study and we preach this to you, uh, just remember that he is preeminent uh, in, the, in the messages, and he is preeminent, even though uh, there will be times when we may not even, you know, we, when we'll mention that, but, uh, but you always remember that in the book of Revelation, he is preeminent. Uh, so it was written by, the, uh, you know, by John the, the Revelator, and uh, he's the one that God held the hand, that held the pen, and uh, it was written, first of all, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So I'm going to take up just a little bit now and read, and, and read a few verses that uh, we read Sunday night, and then we're going to uh, look at these seven churches just for a little bit. Uh, verse number 11 of Revelation chapter number 1, the Bible says this, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and, in, and unto Laodicea. So these churches are not uh, mythical churches that some would, uh, would say. They're not just a spiritualized uh, a place that some would uh, say that they were. Uh, the Bible says here that they are seven churches that, are, that he's going to write to uh, these churches. And he said, send it into the seven churches which are in Asia. So these are literal churches. These are, uh, are literal assemblies. And uh, we find these, and, and all of them had to have a, a different uh, uh, relation with the Lord. Uh, they, some of them start out good, but they don't end good. And so we find these seven churches as this, the church of Ephesus, uh, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are seven, and it is the, when, when it talks about up here, uh, about verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt with a uh, girt with paps with a golden girdle. Now, here we see Jesus is the one walking among the candlesticks. The candlesticks represent these seven churches which we just gave to you. That's what the candlestick stick represents. So seven being the number of completion, uh, the church is the complete act of God. When uh, the true church is God's, is God's bride. When that church is completed, uh, the true church, when it's made up and the bride of Christ is made ready, then you and I are going to leave here in the rapture. Now, I don't believe that can be very long, and you keep watching the news. It goes up and down like a roller coaster. What are we going to do? What are we not going to do? I don't know. But I know one thing. God's got it all in his hand. He's got it all in control, and I lay down a night and sleep good because I know I'm, I'm in God's hands. And I know that when the time comes for him to call his bride up, uh, then you, then uh, you that are saved and, and me are going to go to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we see this as we study these seven churches, and, and uh, we'll see not only seven churches, and I'm getting way ahead of myself, so just let me slow down here a minute, and I'll get with my notes, and maybe I'll keep it a little more together. I, I get excited when I begin to think about these things, because these things must shortly come to pass. So we see these were seven real churches uh, when John wrote the book. At the very time of the writing of the book, while John was on the Isle of Patmos, these were, were seven real churches. Uh, and we see in these seven churches uh, the, the uh, seven golden candlesticks and Christ walking amongst those candlesticks. And we see today also that there are churches like this uh, that are those in Scripture. There are churches around uh, now that are just like these churches. Now, uh, you'll find churches that are like Ephesus, uh, you know, that uh, you know, are, are in love with the Lord. And you'll find churches that have gone completely away from God, but you find a representation, I believe, in churches today that represent these churches. But these also, these seven churches also represent seven different church ages. 
Now I'll slow down. If you're gonna, if you plan on writing anything down, write fast, cause I, I get to going fast. But I'll try to slow down. But remember, uh, the seven churches are are uh, the seven candlesticks. Christ is the one walking among the candlesticks, and uh, these are were seven literal churches, and they were uh, churches today that are like these seven churches, but representative. These individual churches represent different church ages from the time of Christ. So there's seven different church ages. So we see that uh, Ephesus, Ephesus uh, was the church of the first century, uh, beginning right after uh, in, in the book of Acts. Smyrna was the persecuted church of the second and third century. Uh, Pergamos was the church from about uh, 300 to, to 500. That was the church of Pergamos in that time frame. Thyatira uh, was the church of the dark ages from, from 500 to 1600. The church was in a, in a period of darkness. It was, uh, the, the church was around. You can trace the, the real church. You can trace it all the way back to Christ. And, but the church went through the dark days and the dark ages. And when uh, we may study a little bit more about the dark ages, when the church, how the church survived. You know why the church survived? Because it's God's church, friend. It's God's church. It is the bride of Christ. And all through time, the devil's tried to destroy it. Uh, but God's church will prevail. And so we see that uh, the church of Sardis is the church of the Reformation. And uh, Philadelphia is the church of revival in the 19th century when great revival uh, struck uh, the land. Then uh, we see the church of Philadelphia is that church of revival. Now, we don't see great revival striking our land today. We just didn't, just didn't done it. And I, you know why? Because the church of Philadelphia has ceased. Even though there are some churches, see, when I'm saying there's churches that represent this, there are churches having revival. I, and I'm going to tell you something. I think our church is having revival. Now, I'll just tell you, uh, tell you what I think. And, and there is misconception about what revival is. It don't mean necessarily that people are shouting and running the aisles. But we've had people saved. The church is growing. And that is what revival is. And I see our church uh, having uh, having. Uh, the spirit of this church in that we are having a uh, revival. And then last of all, church number seven is the church of Laodicea. And it's, it's the end time church of apostasy. And so we see as a whole today, we see, we see the, the Christianity as a whole today. We see a lot of that turning uh, to apostasy. Uh, there are those today that, that preach false doctrines and tell all manner of, you know, tell all manner of things that are not according to scripture and, and people fall away from the truth of the word of God. Uh, there's big name preachers that, uh, you know, that have great big churches in our land that preach a health and wealth uh, gospel. Friend, that's not in the word of God. And it's wrong. And, and uh, that, you know, those, those things, it's just, it just leads people astray. And then there's those that uh, say that Paul had it all wrong when uh, he wrote the epistles, some of the, some of the epistles, and some of, you know, that's false. It's false teaching, false preaching. Uh, because I have the word of God today, and it is what I base everything that I believe on. And so we see that this is the last church age that we're living in. And you know what? The, the, the first church was the first century. The second church was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, you know, up till about 500. And then we see... A period of time with every church age. Now, the longest was the church that uh, was the church during the dark ages, but every one of them came to an end. And friend, the church at Philadelphia, that church age came to an end when the when the church of Laodicea started, and when that church, which is the present church age, one day, friend, it's going to have its end. That church age is going to end. That is the that is, I believe, the church that. Uh, is represented in our day as the church of Laodicea. And it too is going to have an end. And friend, when it does, the end of it will be when the bride of Christ is raptured out to go to be with the Lord. Now, am I making sense to everybody so far? Anybody got any questions that I've confused you with? All right, so we'll continue on. So now we see seven churches, seven church ages, and what, the, what they are. And I've got just, I'm going to just do three of these tonight, and then we'll be through. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to section this off in, in uh, short sections so I don't try to overwhelm myself as well as you. 
uh, with the study and with the, the uh, teaching of the book of the Revelation. Notice again, let me reiterate that. It is the book of the Revelation. Many people want to say Revelations with an S, but it's not, it, it does not have an S. It is the book of the Revelation. And so we see here now, we'll, we'll look at the church of Ephesus just for a few minutes tonight, and then uh, Smyrna, and then the, uh, the church of Pergamos. Ephesus began in the book of Acts. Uh, it was the, the new church. It was the birth of the church. And the book of Acts, you find out how that uh, thousands were saved and brought in, you, you know, brought in to the church. And that, you know, uh, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and, and many people were saved by God's grace. That is the beginning of the church, uh, the church age of the church of Ephesus. And so uh, when they began to preach and the word of God began to take hold, then the early church was formed and they were, they were excited and they were in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And their excitement, it, you know, it grew and they went out and told others and they went out and told others and they got saved and they went out and told others and they got saved. And that's the way it's really supposed to work today is, is that church that started out. And they started out on fire for God. I mean, they started out, uh, started out for the Lord. Verse number 1 of chapter number 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them uh, which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Now that's talking about the ones that have found, uh, you know, said they were apostles and were not, found them to be liars. They were false prophets even in that day. See, Satan's already attacking. But they were false prophets and they were found out. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Now at the time of this, at the ending of the, uh, the church of Ephesus, they had begun to dwindle down. They had lost their zeal. They had lost much of their desire for the Lord and the things of God. And it didn't take long for that to happen. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitine, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God? So with the church of, Phil uh, the church of Ephesus, the first church, uh, God has, has somewhat against them because they left their first love. Now remember, they started out happy, happy and joyous and on fire for the Lord. And out of this church sprang Paul or Saul and got saved and become Paul. Out of this church came Paul and he went all his missionary journeys were in that first church, out of that first church. And so Ephesus, and, and you know, as, as he wrote, Paul wrote a letter to Ephesus, to the book of Ephesians. He wrote a letter to them in his missionary journeys. And see, that's one reason that I believe in missions so, uh, so deeply, and I have such a place in, for missionaries in my heart, is because that is the way the gospel spread. And that is what, how the church started out was with mission spreading the gospel, telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, there's another reason why I'm so adamant about, uh, you know, about uh, uh, missions and those things that go along with missions. So we see that Paul's uh, journeys, his first missionary journeys took place there. The full of hope and joy, you know, is, uh, they were just full of hope and joy. My friend... Again, you look around at churches today, and how many churches that do you know of uh, that have no joy about them anymore? I have people complain to me because they, you know, I can't do nothing about it. I'm not the pastor. I, can, I cannot help them. But they complain about how boring it is at church. God help us, amen, that we'd not, you know, that we'd have some life about us. And that's why the church of Ephesus, it was a church of life and and uh, that's why people loved it so, because it was a, a church of life and joy and hope. And, but I have people tell me, you know, that, that they go there and they, they sit through it and, and go home. Uh, friend, that ain't the way church is supposed to be. 
And that, that's just not it. Church is supposed to be a place where we get away from, from the world for a little while and come together in fellowship and enjoy each other's presence. Amen? While we're enjoying the presence of the Lord. So the church of Ephesus ends. It, it comes to, uh, you know, it comes to an end. And then begins the church of Smyrna. Uh, verse number 8. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna uh, write these things which, the, write these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogues of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, at the end of every one of these, uh, the, the Spirit of God is, is telling John to write this verse. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That means that in our day, this is relevant to us. Uh, this is relevant to our life and relevant to us being Christians if we understand what these churches went through and, and knowing that we may, some of these things that they went through, we may have to sometime or the things that they did that we don't want to be guilty of. So this is relevant to our day very much so. And uh, maybe more so now than it ever has been because we're that so close to the coming of the, uh, of the Son of the Lord. Now, Smyrna... Uh, that name means myrrh. Myrrh was what was they applied to bodies, even Christ. They, they came with uh, myrrh, or, or she broke the, uh, the box uh, of myrrh upon him. But anyway, it was a spice in that day, and the only way that that spice could be found and could be acquired was those seeds that they got it from had to be beaten and broken and bruised. And so that is, how, that, that is the meaning of the church of Smyrna. It was beaten and broken. Uh, it was the, the church of uh, the second and third century. It was the persecuted church. And it was persecuted by the evil Roman emperors and the evil Roman empire. We notice in these verses that we read to you se several things that, uh, that help us to know that it was a persecuted church we find out the, the word tribulation. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some of you here that's, that has uh, faced some tribulation this week, some trials, some heartaches, some hardships, some struggles. Well, this church was a church of tribulation. It was a church of, of suffering because we notice that's what it says in the verses, that there was suffering. It was a church of poverty. You know, where, where uh, people were kept down and tried to be held down and, and, and had nothing because it was a persecuted church. And it was a church where many of them, for their belief, wound up in prison and were cast into prison for their faith and for their belief. Uh, the Roman Empire desired to destroy and eradicate Christianity. Now, the devil's been at it. Since Genesis one, one or Genesis chapter number three and verse fifteen, the devil has tried been trying to destroy Christ and the church. And here in the second and third centuries, we find that these Roman the Roman Empire wanted to eradicate, do away with, totally uh, you know, totally do away with Christianity. But they did not succeed. Why? Because Christ is still alive, friend, and Christianity is not. Uh, man-made it is of Christ and and because we're Christians because we're Christ the church will will remain alive and well and even in this time of the dark days and dark ages here of this of this persecution of the church Christ uh, was still their central thought and even though they were persecuted uh, and even though they you know they suffered in prison and had tribulation and sorrow still Jesus was with them in that church of persecution the uh, there, there were ten. I don't have all ten of them's names, but I, the, and I can get them. I just didn't have time to do all that. And, and if I got into all that, we'd been here too long. But two of those emperors, the first one was Nero, and the last one was Constantine. And they all decided to uh, try to eradicate Christianity, but they could not do it. Now, uh, 
ten, thousands of them were killed, though. Thousands of Christians were killed in the church of persecution, in the church of Smyrna. And, and I, you know, they were, they were uh, many of them just beaten to death. Many of them were, were tied to a, a post and, and set on fire and burned to death. And, you know, many different ways were they persecuted and, and put to death. But there was a great slaughter of Christians uh, trying to eradicate the church. And, it, you know, testimony was of some of them that were, you were talking about how good the Lord was to them when they were being, you know, when they were being persecuted or even when they were being put to death. That's God, friend. It's God. It's the grace of God. And we find it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that the grace of God is sufficient no matter what we're going through. Whatever persecution it might be. I've often thought to myself, what will I do if it comes the time in my life when I have to face such persecution? Now, I hope and I pray that my answer to all that will be I'll stand for the Lord no matter what. I'll, I'll, and you know why I'll do that? Because it'll be by the grace of God giving me grace and courage to stand for him. And given, get, no matter what the outcome may be, if someone walked in here tonight and said, will you renounce your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ by the grace and courage of God, I'll say no. If I rely upon the flesh, then this flesh is weak, and it might do that. It might recant. But by the grace and help of the Lord and by his courage and having on the whole armor of God, then you and I will be able to stand during our day of persecution. If it should come our way, you and I will be stand by the, by the grace of God and, and look to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, help me. I love you, and I'm not going to deny you. God help us that we, that we would uh, be that way if persecution, that kind of persecution ever comes to us. And so many of them did. Many of them, that they were... Uh, uh, crucified even some of them, uh, burned to death, uh, tortured and beaten. And so during Christentine's time as emperor, he decided that he was going to become a Christian. Oh, the man got saved. Well, his underlying motive to all that was that he become a part of Christianity. And he didn't really get saved. He just announced that that was what he was going to do, what he was going to be, and he was going to join it. And so therefore he proclaimed that Christianity would be the state religion, that everybody had to become a Christian. So the government got into the affairs of the church, and so there was more persecution because they began to tell them what to do. They began to take their money, and it was all about the riches of the church. And friend, I see today where the government would love to get their hands on the money of the churches. And how they would love to start taxing the churches because of the money. There's a lot of money in churches. There's a lot of, you know, uh, a, a lot of money out there that they could tax and, and gain uh, stuff to, you know, gain more money to pay for the stuff that they don't need or we don't need or is a bunch of foolishness. But we see that that's what happened in this day. The government got in inside to the, you know, inside the church and uh, as Christianity became that state religion, it's like many countries today, there are state religions where you can say only certain things, you can preach only certain things, and uh, people are free to go there, but they can only hear certain things, and that's what's, what's delegated by the state that they can say. God help us. I would, I would, I would not do it at all if I can't preach under the, under the anointing of the Spirit of God and say what God gives me to preach, I just wouldn't do it. I'd find me a, I'd find me a group of people somewhere, four or five, and we'd get off in the woods somewhere, and I'd have to calm my voice down, but I'd try my best to preach the Word of God to somebody uh, in, in those last days. So the church of Smyrna was the, was the church of persecution. And then last of all, we see the church of Pergamos. And uh, the church of Pergamos, it, it means uh, that it was married. That word means married. And the church of Pergamos that followed uh, the, the church of Smyrna that church was married to the world. No difference. That church, now that listen, during all of this, you always remember Christ is the central theme. And in all of these three churches, even though the church as a whole had sold out to the world, God still had a few, amen, that wanted to stay by the stuff. Amen. 
And that's what I think of today. We might see a whole lot of churches that sell out to the world and sell out to worldly pleasures and sell out to worldly things and uh, don't separate themselves from the rest of the world and it all because of, of the monetary gain and gaining the big crowd. But God's always got those, those few. There's always that remnant of God's people that are going to stay with God no matter what. There's those that had rather have Jesus than anything. And friend, I believe we're such a church. I believe that we'd rather have the Lord around here than, than the house full and packing out and building the building. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus here. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. And I just appreciate all the good things of the Lord. And friend, the, the church of Pergamos was married, and they were married to the world. They had two doctrines of belief. One was the doctrine of, of uh, Balaam, and that was the doctrine of tolerance. That was one of their thoughts of Balaam was the doctrine of tolerance. Now, have we not come there today? You know, ain't that where we're at today? Is just be tolerant. Just be tolerant of, of it. Be tolerant of sin. Accept sin. And I, you know, I've heard people say, you know, let down a little bit and uh, you'll draw a better crowd. No, amen. Stay with the word of God. Stay with the stuff. And if God's word will, will attract people, and if God's word don't do it, friend, uh, there's, uh, you know, there, there's uh, help to be needed. But it all comes from the word of God. But so, so we don't, we, you know, we don't want to, I, I don't want to ever tolerate sin. Call it what it is. Say what it is. And don't tolerate sin. Now, I'm around sin all day. You know, about every day of my life, I'm around sin. And I have to be around it. And I have to see it. And I have to look at it. And and uh, when I see those things, I understand it's going on, but I don't tolerate it in my life. Amen? I don't want to tolerate it in my life. And, and we should be that way. We can be in this world, but still be apart, uh, apart from this world. We don't have to be in this world and be a part of this world, but we're in this world, and we're letting our, we should be letting our light so shine before men that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. And that should be our daily stand. Listen. If I got away from the world entirely, I saw up in the mountains today, and it's, now I know why I saw that. I'd never seen it before. I've wandered, those, I've wandered those hills around the house up there for all my life since I was a little boy, a able to get in the woods and, and cut a grapevine down and swing it out over a rock and would scare Mama to death if she knowed I'd done it. Uh, but ever, ever since I was able to get out in the woods, I've rambled those mountains. And, I mean, I've been everywhere. We've done everything. You, you name it, we did it out there in the woods, you know, carrying on and, and, and uh, running about. But I came across a place today which I'd never seen before. And it was a, it was a cave. It was a, a pretty big cave. And uh, I don't know how far it goes back in there. I didn't have a light. That's the only reason I didn't find out. So I turned my light on on my, on my cell phone. It goes wherever I go, you know, it's my cell phone. But I turned the light on, I stuck it in there, and I couldn't see nothing, so I didn't venture in there to see. But I thought, you know, that'd be a good place to hide. That'd be a, a good place to get out of the rain. That'd be a good place for a bear to be in there. Or a snake. Or worst of all, a rat. Oh. <laughs> Believe me, I'd rather see the first two as that rat. And, and, I, and, I, and, and now I think, you know, I could go back I could go back in a place such as that, put myself entirely apart from this world, stay there with nothing. I mean, stay there with nothing. I'd go crazy, but I'd stay there with nothing. And I still couldn't get away from this world system because there's things in my mind that I'll never get away from. But see, even if I did that, and I, and I separated myself entirely from all the world and become like those monks that never talk to nobody and and I don't know what they do all day long, but anyway, besides shave their head. But, but anyway, you see all that going on, and you think, you know, if I, if I would be like that, and if I as a preacher could get like that and stay like that, what good would I be to anybody? What good would you be to anybody if you weren't out in this world? You wouldn't be no good to nobody. Because it's you and I that are the light, and we're the, the uh, Gary says... Gary Phillips, he says, and I agree with him, that there's no such thing as darkness. Now, preacher, you get outside night and it's dark. But there's no such thing as darkness. Does anybody agree with me? Nobody's going to agree with me. There's no such thing as darkness. You agree with me. You know what it is? It's the absence of light. 
It's not darkness, it's just there's no light there. And, and the way you can prove that is get in a dark place and strike a match. It ain't dark. There just ain't no light there. And so it, we're, in a, we're in a dark world. And one of these days the light is going to leave this world, which is you and I. And then you're talking about dark, my friend. There'll be an absence of light when we leave this world. And that is going to be a dark day. So the, back to where we was at there, when we were looking at, at Balaam, it's the doctrine of tolerance. Be tolerant to everything. And we run in a world where we might be a part of it, but we don't have to become a part of it. And so that doctrine of tolerance, we see that very much in the world today. Uh, you know, we see the preaching of many that's waxing uh, cold even. The love of many are waxing cold. The preaching of preachers is getting to where it's just, you know, I'll, I'll preach just to keep my congregation together. Amen. That's all right. Go ahead. I'm going to preach what the Word of God says. And that seems to work. All the, I've watched too many preachers down through the years preach the Word of God, and the church gets stronger and stronger. Why? Because that's where your faith comes from. So it was a doctrine of tolerance. It was a doctrine that uh, a, a preaching of fame and fortune, and it was very corrupted. And then the, the uh, doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and I've got to study some more on this, but it basically was a, a, uh, a doctrine of deeds and works. Now, how much of that do we see going on today? Well, just do good and you'll be all right. Just do the best you can. When it's all over, you'll, you'll go to heaven. But I say to you today, salvation is still by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look on at these churches, and I'm going to stop there tonight because I've had enough to chew on. Amen. Myself, I've had enough to chew on here. And I'll begin to, you know, I'll begin to study these other ones as we go along. How many of you are enjoying your reading of the book of Revelation?